A retired couple have become very concerned with all things that are going on in the world in their time. And they feared that eventually there would be some sort of nuclear war. They had really fed into the paranoia of all that. And so they began to travel and search for different places they felt would be the safest place to live. And they looked and traveled and stayed and traveled and kept going. And then in December of 1981, they sent a postcard to their minister letting them know they had found the place that they were settling on the Falkland Islands. Well, as you know the story, in April of 1982, war broke out <laughs> over the Falkland Islands. So their peace was quickly disturbed. You know, it's just a human tendency to want peace, which amazes me because I think people say, oh, they want peace, peace, but, you know, they keep turning on the news. I'm like, no, you're not going to get it that way. Because the news just keeps telling us about chaos and evil and horror and terror and this and that. I'm like, every way that can disturb our peace, you know, that certainly comes through that. But some people are so bothered by that, they try to get away from it completely. They don't want to know about the world. You know, they might go to work and whatever, but then they have an isolated place they can go to. Some even have like an isolated island. I saw these, uh, these things where people go house hunting and stuff like that. And they go looking at places where there's like, really, I'm talking like, wow, did they, I didn't know that place existed. <laughs> I didn't know that it was such an island on the, on the map. But they go there because they're looking for tranquility. They're looking to get away. They're looking for peace. And of course, they're looking at any, any place they can go to to get that. But the irony, of course, is that we know we live in a time of chaos, constant turbulence when it comes to political matters, economic matters, social matters, always something going on. There was a study by the former president of the Norwegian Academy of Sciences and historians from England, Egypt, Germany, and India, and they came up with some startling information. And I, when I saw it, I was amazed. I was like, since 3600 BC, the world has only known 292 years of peace. During this period, there have been 14,351 wars, large and small, and 3.64 billion people have been killed. Since 650 BC, there have, also, there have also been 1,656 arm races, only 60, 16 of which ended, have not ended in war. But they did end in mostly economic collapse for those nations. And when I saw those stats and I saw all those things, I thought of that cynical quote that I, that I read many years ago, which was amazing when I read it, because I'm reading I think it's going to talk about peace. But it said, peace is that tranquil moment where everyone stops and reloads. And there's a lot of truth in that. It seems like people, yeah, it's only peace for, well, let me have peace so I can get new armament and new things. Almost like everybody's been reading uh, Sun Tzu, The Art of War. You know, prepare yourself, get all your armament ready, and then uh, have a skirmish with your enemy, attack your enemy. Well, this morning we're going to look at peace. You know, we looked at love, we looked at joy, and today we want to look at peace. And peace, of course, here doesn't just mean no war. It means the presence of God. It means having uh, what the Hebrew people call shalom, you know, tranquility, peace of mind, peace of body, uh, wholeness, prosperity, you know, healing. All these things were encompassed in that beautiful word. And certainly when Paul speaks about peace, he doesn't have the Greek idea in mind. He has the Hebrew idea in mind. But there are very important things we must see about this. And the first thing, of course, is that it comes from God. Jesus told us in John chapter 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. So the first thing we see is that God is the one that establishes the peace. God is the one who can give us true, authentic, everlasting peace. We cannot get it anywhere else. I remember when I was a boy, which was pretty amazing, I guess, for that time, but when I was a boy... I was given a bunch of 45s, and uh, you know, I said, oh wow, great, a bunch of 45s, and I got to play through them. And I remember one of them, I can't play it over, I, can't, I don't know who did the song, I have to look it up, I gotta Google it. But there was one, uh, one band that kept saying, um, their song was, there will never be peace until God is seated at the conference table. And I thought, wow, you know. So even as a young boy, I'm hearing this, as this is a norm, there's no way we're gonna have peace unless God is involved. And that's exactly what happens, God gets involved to bring peace to us. Paul tells in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Paul has been in chapters 1 through 4 of Romans leading up to this point. He's told us that humanity is sinful. Humanity left to themselves does not, do not seek after God. If you leave man to himself, if you leave them in their own state and God does not interfere, man will not seek God. On the contrary, man gets more and more decadent and worse and worse and worse. And he said, it doesn't matter which man it is. It doesn't matter if it's the Jewish people who had the law or the Gentiles who had their conscience. It doesn't matter. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. All seek after their own things. None seek after God. And after saying all that, he says, but God seeks after man. God has come to save us. God has come to rescue us. It is God who has initiated the process of reconciliation. We were at war with God. We had hatred towards God. We were working against God. And it's God who comes to bring us peace, to offer us the, the offering of peace through Jesus Christ. We did not look, go looking for him. He came looking for us. And through Christ, we are offered justification. And justification means that we are declared to be right before God because of the work of Jesus Christ. It's not because of anything that we have done, no good work, no glorious deeds, nothing of the sort. It's because of what Christ has done that God can now say, I declare you to be in the right with me. It means that now we are part of the family of Abraham, that we are the children of God. What a glorious thing, but it's not ours. We did not create it. And because of that, we have shalom. The peace of God comes into our lives. And certainly all of you who are here are believers know that moment in your life. When you ask God to come into your life, when you repented of your sins and asked Jesus to come in and you felt the peace of God just come over you and embody you. And you felt, oh my goodness. And you know, that, that sense of healing in our lives. The things that were going wrong, the things that were heading in the right, wrong direction now began to turn in the right direction. And God began to work in our minds and hearts to bring us that peace and that healing and that tranquility. But it also meant, as Paul says here, that it gave us access to God. You know, in the ancient, this is a very interesting word because in the ancient world, this word was used of entering the presence of a king. And one thing you know about the ancient world is that you could not enter into the presence of a king without permission. If you tried to come in without permission, you took your own life into your hands. You know, when Esther decides to go in and speak to the king, and she's not been summoned, she's taking her own life into her hands. And this word says that now we don't have to be summoned, that we have access, that we can come right in to the presence of God, and that we don't have to come in groveling and begging like we're somehow not worthy. Not worthy. We don't come in simply recognizing that he's creator. He is creator. He's redeemer. He's sustainer. But when we come into his presence, we come to him as father. He is our father. We can go right up to him and talk to him face to face. We don't have to look down. We don't have to be shamed. Nothing. We can come right into his presence and say, Dad, I want to talk to you. That's amazing. That is powerful. And he says that because of that, because we have that access, we also have access to the glory of God that was lost in Adam. Adam lost that great glory of the presence of God. And now because of Jesus Christ, it's been regained. And now we can have it. And it begins our lives even now. And slowly but surely we will have it until we stand in his presence and we are completely glorified. And we're made completely in his image. Those who place their trust in anyone other than Christ will awaken from this life to a nightmare, to a real nightmare. Because they think they have found their peace or they have tried to create some sort of peace. But apart from Christ, there is no peace. There is no peace between us and God except through Jesus Christ. And there'll be no internal peace within us without Jesus Christ. And that's the second thing I want us to look at. Not simply that we have the peace that comes from God, but that peace is to be part of our lives. That peace is to be part of everything that we do. But amazingly, how easily we are carried away by the cares, the worries, the anxieties of this life. No need to raise your hand. I'm sure we're all there at least one day or two days, maybe in three days during the week. We get carried away by the worries, concerns, and cares of this world. Paul says to us in Philippians 4, 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The problem is that we have all these worries, all these cares, all these anxieties, because we are controlled by what we see rather than by whom we know. See how important that? We are controlled by what we see rather than by whom we know. We look at the world, we look at situations, we let those things control us rather than focusing on Jesus Christ. We're trusting the wrong things. We're putting our trust in the wrong place. And of course, all of us need to trust. Trust is vital to our survival as human beings. Everybody trusts. Every single day we're trusting people. Every single day we're trusting someone else or something else. Every single day. Even the most cynical person. You know, those, those old bitter people. I don't trust anybody. Yeah. Yes, you do. Every single day you have to trust people or you wouldn't be alive. Now, we may stop trusting for a while. Somebody might hurt us. Somebody might offend us. We, you know, we, we don't want to get hurt anymore, so we back off. But we can't do it for long because we have to trust. It's just part of our DNA. Think about it. Every single day, children trust their parents without thinking about it. They trust that their mom and dad will feed them and care for them. I never had to worry when I was a kid, oh, wow, is there going to be dinner on the table? Never. We were dead poor, and I never had to worry about dinner on the table. I didn't have to worry about, gee, are my clothes clean? Will somebody wake me up to go to school? Never. We always just unconsciously trust that our parents will be there. We trust that our spouse will support us, our spouse will be there for us, our spouse will care for us. We trust that our friends will help us in time of need, that, our, that we can turn to our friends. We even trust that the bus will be there when it says it'll be there because it says so on the schedule. Think about it. We just unconsciously trust all the time. No matter what it is, we trust that these things will happen. The problem is when we take the trust that belongs to God and put it somewhere else. Eddie, are you listening? Okay. The great German theologian because someone said that the only time I mention Germans is when I mention Hitler. So for now on, every time I, I quote a German, I will tell you, I'm always, I'm always reading Germans and I'm always quoting Germans. The great German theologian, Martin Luther, said, The faith and trust of the heart makes both God and idol. The faith and trust of the heart makes both God and idol. That's a deep theological thought. I'm going to try to say it as best as possible and as efficiently and quickly as possible. And here it is. There's a trust that belongs to God and to God alone. And when you take that trust and put it anywhere else, you've created an idol. There's a trust that belongs to God and God alone. Nobody else can have it. There's a trust that exists between parents and children, a trust that exists between spouses, a trust that exists between friends, but there's an ultimate trust, a complete and utter trust that belongs only to one, and that's God. And when you take that and you put it anywhere else, you've created an idol for yourself. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be an idea. It could be a person. It could be a thing. It doesn't matter. Only one is worthy of that trust, and only one should be given that trust. The Lord tells us in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 9, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. In other words, if you don't stand on the only foundation that's unshakable and enduring, you will not be able to stand. You need to only stand on God. That is the unshakable, enduring rock. Everything else is shifting sand. Everything else can fail and will fail, but not God. But the fact is that we keep putting our trust everywhere else. We trust the stock market. We trust our properties and our possessions. We even trust that our health will remain. We're constantly putting the trust that belongs to God in every place but God. And doesn't that make sense? Think about it. Just stop and think about it. 
If you put your trust in the stock market, what happens to your faith? Right? If you put it in your property, oh, beautiful, oh, oh no, it's, it's being devalued now. Every day it gets devalued more. You know, a fire occurs, you've lost it. You put your ultimate trust in the fact that you are physically fit, that everything's fine, you go to a doctor, <gasps> now you collapse. Because your trust is on what you see rather than in God. You've created an idol for yourself. You might even be your own idol. You might say, well, oh, I don't worship anything or anyone. Yeah, you worship yourself. <laughs> you know, you think that you are self-sufficient, that you'll be able to do everything on yourself. And the truth is, you can't. But when we trust in God, we know that He is unshakable, and He is enduring, and He takes care of us. And that's how the peace of God comes to us. I want to read that passage again by Paul and take you to a second point of that passage. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Lay your worries, your anxieties, your cares before God. Go and speak to God about your worries and anxieties and fears. You're getting ulcers because you're not talking to God and laying it before God and leaving it before God. You are a nervous wreck because you're not giving your worries to God. Because you keep trying to carry them. And you keep trying to solve your own problems. And you keep messing up. And yet God says, come, give them to me. Trust me. And the amazing thing is that once we come to the Lord... What happens when we come to God? You may, all of you know this. We stay away from the Lord. We don't want to talk to Him. We don't share with Him what's going on. All of a sudden, we come to Him and we begin to share. And what happens? You feel the peace of God just come over you because you're speaking your worry, your anxiety away to Him. And you're trusting Him to take care of it instead of carrying it yourself. Ironically, we try so hard to carry those things. And the great thing is that even if you come before God, and you don't know what to say. You don't know how to say it. God has even made provision for that. Do you know that? That even, even when you go to God and you're crying and you're breaking down and you can't even figure out what's wrong with you. And you don't even know what to pray. God has even provided for that. In Romans chapter 8 verses 26 and 27. Paul tells us, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Hallelujah. That is awesome. That even when I come before God and I don't know what to say and I don't know how to say it and all, all I can do is just groan and moan and cry and not... The Holy Spirit in me is praying to God and telling Him what I need to say, what I truly need. That's awesome. And yet it's amazing that we still try to carry our burdens instead of come before and lay before and let go. The great hymn writer says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. We keep trying to carry our own burdens. And yet God says here in this passage that if we lay it before Him with gratitude, knowing who He is, that the peace of God will guard our minds. The word guard there in the Greek it talks about a garrison of soldiers. The peace of God will come to your mind and to your heart like soldiers protecting a city and will protect you from those fears and anxieties and worries. We carry them because we have our eyes on the wrong thing. You know, when you're having problems with what you see, close your eyes. Trust God. Trust Him. We allow the things of this world to definitely manipulate us. And yet it's so ironic that, we've, that so many times we're manipulated by things that we worry so much and then in the end it comes up to nothing. But it's all because of what we see. The peace of God has already come because we are believers. But we forfeit that peace when we allow worries and anxieties to rule our minds. 
We have to let the peace of God rule over us. And of course, if you do, if you have the peace of God, hallelujah. If it rules your life, amen, it should. But it shouldn't end there either. And that takes me to my third point. The peace of God has to go out from us to others as well. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. The only other place where that word peacemaker occurs in the New Testament, it's in verbal form. In Colossians 1, verse 20, where it talks about Christ, says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through the blood shed on the cross. Christ is the ultimate example of a peacemaker. He brings the peace of God to us. He brings reconciliation to us. He is the mediator that came between God and us to tell us the good news, to let us know that there is going to be peace. And now we, as Christians who have the peace of God, are to take that peace and take it out into the world. As Robert Gulick stands, states in his commentary, the peacemakers refer to those who, experiencing the shalom of God, become his agents establishing his peace in the world. But here's the catch. The peace of God has to be real in your life. And it has to be real in your congregation. Because that's actually who Jesus is speaking to when he's talking to the disciples. He's talking to the community of faith. And he says, you must be peacemaker. Peacemakers begins in the house of God. Because think about it. How can you go into the world and tell them about peace and reconciliation and harmony and love and mercy and all these wonderful things and not have it in the house of God? We become a joke. People will laugh at us, whether we, they do it openly or not. They will laugh at us because it is humorous. If someone, someone's trying to tell you about, you know, someone who believes in positive thinking is trying to tell you to be positive, but yet they're negative about their own life. Or negative about their family life. You'd be like, my goodness, apply your own beliefs. If you really believe in the peace of God, if you really believe in making peace, start in your own house. How can you have peace there? If you don't have peace there, how can you have it in the world? It has to begin in the house of God. And we have to make sure that we are agents of peace. Peacemakers. Not peacekeepers. Peacemakers. Generating the peace of God. But if we're seeking to harm others, if we're seeking to gossip and destroy them, we're not peacemakers. We're people who are looking for animosity and hatred and looking to see things get worse in the world and even in our churches. Now we know, of course, in church, you know, there are believers and there are non-believers. But even taking that aside, you know, those who bear the name of Christ should be like Christ or not bear his name. If you can't bear his name correctly, then get rid of the name. Don't use it. Don't call yourself a Christian. Call yourself whatever else. You know, call yourself an atheist. Bring them down. You know, but don't bring down Christians. And if we have that peace within our, our, ourselves, we have it within our congregation, then we are to go into the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 20 says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Awesome. We are ambassadors of Christ. Wherever you go, you represent Jesus Christ. Now we know, of course, in the ancient world, an ambassador, even today, was a dignitary. And they went somewhere from one, from one country to another country and they brought the message that their king or their president, whoever, wants them to bring. They didn't bring their own message and their own ideas. They were bringing the message that belongs to their king, their ruler, and conveying that message. Now, the one difference, of course, is as Paul makes clear in his writings, um, being an ambassador of Christ is not such a neat little thing. It's not like we get to go somewhere and people set us up and they, you know, and they feed us and take care of us. He says, on the contrary, we're ambassadors that are in warfare. Because everywhere we go telling the message of peace, people might be hostile towards us and hate us. Everywhere Paul went preaching the, the message of the gospel, 
he was getting beaten up, insulted. You know, people wanted to kill him. So it was, it was a very messy business to be an ambassador of Christ. But he understood that that was his job. That is our job. We are to take this great message. What is a great message of peace? If we look at a world that's in turmoil, we look at so many broken hearts, so many people out there hurting, and we don't speak the word of peace to them. How horrible that we would hold that to ourselves. But make no mistake about it, it's not easy. As Benjamin Franklin once told John Adams in a letter, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers is, I suppose, for another world. In this world, they are frequently cursed. Certainly in this world, they're not called blessed. In this world, they're cursed. And certainly many times, when you try to bring peace to someone, you try to speak peace, they might turn their armament on you. You know, it's funny, in a, in a place where when two people are in animosity against each other or two nations are against each other, and you try to intervene, <laughs> then they put the focus on you. <laughs> then you become the enemy. Somehow neither, neither side will trust you because you're trying to bring peace between two parties. And their mindset becomes, well, if they're not for me, they must be against me. <laughs> they're trying to be, bring peace. They don't understand my real situation. But of course, it is very difficult to see peace come into this world. It truly will not occur completely until Christ returns. Impossible. It just won't happen. When I see all these endeavors at peace, I, I think they're so noble that human beings are trying. Yeah, we should try. But we should have no illusions to think that it's always going to work. That somehow we're going to go speak peace and people are going to say, oh, thank you. I didn't know. Wow. They're going to hate you. If they want to feed their animosity, their hatred, they're, they're, they're just the disgust to bring war and hatred, they're going to dislike you. That's why Paul even says in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, if possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. I love that. <laughs> so realistic. If it's possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. You can make all the endeavors you want to be at peace with others. You can make all the endeavors to try to bring peace between nations and people. But it doesn't mean you're going to succeed. And you must be ready for that. But you try the best on your part to make sure that you're bringing that peace. That you're taking the steps that you need to take in order to see the peace of God that has been brought through Jesus Christ and lives in you go out into the world. It's a beautiful fruit. You know, everybody wants world peace. Everybody wants peace. They don't want to pay the price that it takes. And even between us and God, we don't want to come before Him and confess our sins and admit that we are at war with Him. But if you know the Lord, then you have been reconciled and you have peace with God. Maintain the peace of God in your heart. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts and set it out into the world. And so I'll conclude with the benediction that Paul has in one of his letters. He says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your great love and mercy. We thank you, dear God, that you have set before us a tremendous example of how you are a peacemaker. How you left your throne to come to us and to reconcile us unto yourself. We thank you for the peace of Christ that lives within us. Father, help us to trust you, to lay everything before you so that your peace will guard our minds and our hearts. And Lord, help us as we go out into a world that is so hostile, constantly feeding animosity, to be able to preach peace into our schools, into our homes, into the streets, into our governments, that indeed, dear God, they also might share in the peace of Christ. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.